as people are trickling in here, I'm just going to let you know a couple of housekeeping things. First of all, uh, this presentation right here uh, is going to be good for some AICP uh, and other continuing ed credits. Uh, there will be an email that goes out after this uh, with some instructions on how to get access to those if that's something that you need or uh, would like. Um, we also just uh, to reiterate are offering a follow up. Uh, ask me anything. We're not going to uh, have a chance today to do questions uh, in the hour that we have here. We have an entire site, uh, the Strong Towns community site It's at community.strongtowns.org. Um, and on that site, we've got a place for ask me anything questions as a follow up to this web broadcast. And so Again, in the email we're going to send you after this is done, you're going to get a link for that. Uh, I recommend you write your questions down or you can uh, go to community.strongtowns.org right now as we're talking and enter your questions there as we go. Uh, we will on Thursday at the same exact time uh, gather and I will try to uh, answer as many of those questions as I can in the time that we've got. Uh, one of the reasons we want to make sure they're on the community site is because there's a lot of people hanging out there answering questions helping each other out and you know if we don't get to your question um there's a chance that we answered it before and the answer is up there or that someone else there can answer it or that one of us will uh hang out of the community site because we do that quite a bit too and try to answer your question there so I am going to uh, share my screen once again, and we are going to get started. This is uh, a presentation that um, we've called in the past, uh, Transportation in the Next American City. Uh, I've, I've rebranded a little bit, Confessions of a Traffic Engineer. And if you hang with till the end, I have a little bit of an announcement along those lines of why we've, uh, we've made this shift. So just very brief, uh, our mission is to support a model of development that allows our cities, towns, and neighborhoods to become financially strong and resilient. Uh, I'm assuming you're all here because you are plugged into what's going on at strongtowns.org. If you're not, uh, go there and check it out. We're publishing two, three articles a day. Uh, we've got three different podcast streams. We're sharing a, a lot of information about how we make our cities financially strong and resilient. This presentation today is going to be about transportation. Um, what are the things that is a truism about transportation? And I'm 46 years old. I've been working in this profession for over two decades now. And what we see throughout that entire period of time, and really anyone that you talk to that's been involved in transportation, is we have way more needs than we have budget. We have uh, repairs we need to make. We've got congestion we need to fight. We've got safety improvements we need to do. And of course we want to invest for growth and we just don't have enough money to do these things. We have all these demands being placed on our systems. We have retirees that have different demands and, and different things that they would like to see than maybe they did a decade or two ago. We have this new group of, of young people coming up who uh, use transportation in ways that are completely different than uh, people even in my generation. My daughter is uh, learning to drive right now, has no desire to drive at all. <laughs> it's a very different thing than when I was her age. Um, so we're being pushed in different ways to adapt and change our system. And we just don't have enough money to do these things. Um, we have all these additional things that we want to do, all these investments we want to make in transit, in biking and in walking infrastructure, things that I think we look out broadly and everyone says like, we need to be doing more and we just don't have enough money. It's obvious what needs to happen, right? We need more money. The one thing that we seem to agree on or the one thing there seems to be a consensus on in, a, in, a, in a, almost a bipartisan way is that our transportation uh, system is woefully underfunded and needs dramatically more money so that we can do the things we need to do. The American Society of Civil Engineers, kind of the go-to organization, uh, put out a report. And by the way, I talk about this report extensively in chapter four of my book. Chapter four is called The Infrastructure Cult. And uh, if you're interested in knowing more information about this, uh, Strong Towns is the name of the book. Um, in chapter four, I, I go through this report that the American Society of Civil Engineers put out where they said 
We have an annual transportation funding gap of $94 billion a year. And that is an amount not uh, to make big splashy investments and do all kinds of things. That's just an amount to maintain what we have now. If we want to maintain the things that we have today, uh, from a national transportation infrastructure standpoint, this is not the cul-de-sac in front of your house or the sidewalk up the street. Um, this is national infrastructure, interstates. Uh, we need $94 billion more a year than what we're spending now. I wanna give you some perspective on this because the way we fund national transportation infrastructure in theory uh, is through the gas tax. And so if we look, the current gas tax is 18.4 cents a gallon. There's a conversation that's been going on for quite a while that because the gas tax has not been changed since the 1990s, it has lost purchasing power due to inflation. Uh, if we just adjusted it for inflation, we would not have this huge backlog, this huge hole that we're in right now. And so if we did adjust it for inflation, uh, it, to the gas tax today would be around 30 cents a gallon. Um, just for comparison, we said, what, what if we adjusted it, not for inflation, but for GDP growth? There's this kind of theory that when we invest in transportation, we grow the economy. Uh, you know, the investments we've made have created economic growth. What if, what if these two are growing in tandem? We'd then be in that 30 cent a gallon range. So an increase of about 12 cents a gallon. What if we adjusted it for traffic growth? We're gonna increase the amount of the gas tax uh, by the amount that traffic grows. We're gonna to try to uh, keep up with traffic growth. We, we'd be a little bit less. So traffic has grown a little bit less than the inflation rate over this period of time. But what if we were gonna raise the gas tax to pay for uh, that shortfall? What, what would that mean? What, what would we need to raise the gas tax for in order to make up for the funding shortfall that the American Society of Civil Engineers has identified, well, that would be almost 80 cents a gallon. And understand that that's also a static analysis. That assumes that as we raise the gas tax, nobody drives any less. Um, in dynamic market terms, we understand that the higher the price of gas goes, the less people drive, the more you have to raise the tax to get the same amount of money, the less people drive, it becomes this uh, downward spiraling loop. Either way, 78 cents a gallon is, is never going to happen in, in any reasonable kind of uh, world or any, any, any predictable kind of world that we can imagine today. Um, when we look at the same report that the American Society of Civil Engineers put out, they, they said that over the next decade, uh, the cost of inaction, if we don't do anything, if, if we don't spend the money we need to spend maintaining our national infrastructure, that was going to cost families and businesses a trillion dollars. In order to avoid that loss, uh, the same exact report recommended we spend 220 billion a year, or uh, when you take 220 billion times 10, 2.2 uh, .2 trillion dollars over that same period of time. Um, this seems a little bizarre, right? It, it gets crazier. Uh, looking out over a 30 year period, the American Society of Civil Engineers said that GDP will grow uh, slower than it otherwise would if we fail to make the proper investments in transportation. Um, that depression in GDP will result in the federal government uh, failing to collect $540 billion it otherwise would have collected if GDP had grown at the rates American Society of Civil Engineers was projecting. In order to avoid that $540 billion loss to the federal treasury, the ASC is recommending that the federal government spends $6.6 .6 trillion over this exact same period of time. I can't see your faces, um, but often when I present this stuff to crowds, this is where I start to lose them uh, because there's a credibility gap here. They'll say, Chuck, no respectable organization is gonna publish a report that says this. Like you're, you're pulling our leg, like this cannot possibly be true. And I swear to you, this is true. Of course, the report doesn't, word it this way, right? Um, you know, if we go back a, a slide, uh, the report doesn't say, let's spend 2.2 trillion to save a trillion. It says in kind of true propaganda form, here's all the costs, all the burdens that people will bear. By the way, a trillion dollars of loss, the cost of inaction is not actually a trillion dollars. It's the equivalent of a trillion dollars of people stuck in traffic. It's the loss of your time. It's the added wear and tear in your vehicle. It's not a trillion dollars. 
Um, they also don't say spend 2.2 trillion. They say spend 220 billion a year. And so the way the report looks like, it's kind of written to say there's these huge costs that we all bear. And then all we need to do is just spend this nice little happy amount every year. All I've done is basic math. Math that, by the way, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and, and all the places that published this propaganda didn't bother to do. Very simple third grade multiplication. Let me give you a sense of why this kind of stuff happens. Here's Highway 91 in California. Um, this was a, a project, one of the most congested highways in the United States. There's a project recently to add some extra lanes onto Highway 91. Here's how it was reported in the local newspaper. Um, the project will give some relief to drivers in the regular lanes, raising their average rush hour speeds from eight miles an hour to 9.4 miles an hour. Let's just be clear. Nobody's life has made any better because they can commute at 9.4 miles an hour instead of eight miles an hour. Um, but if we look at the math that the infrastructure cult, that the ASCE, that, that the transportation uh, industry uses to justify projects, you can say 1.4 mile an hour uh, quicker times, you know, 300,000 vehicles that drive through here every day times 365 days a year times uh, $30 an hour that the typical Southern Californian uh, makes at their job uh, equals billions and billions of dollars of saved uh, time, uh, you know, due to this modest, tiny little increase in value. Uh, this is a, a ludicrous application of economic math, yet this is the type of thing we do all the time to justify spending billions of dollars and doing projects that really create no benefit and no value to people. So we need more money. Do we really? Do we really need more money? And I think even a more important question than do we need more money is what do we do if we're not going to get the money? If we don't have the money, what do we do then? If we're not going to raise the gas tax to 90 cents a gallon, if, if we're going to continue uh, to, you know, kind of float things along and just pretend uh, that things are okay, if every local government is going to have a massive backlog of road maintenance that they're never going to get to, what, what do we do then? What then? This is where I want to help you start today. There's a, a saying from a British physicist in World War II. They were um, working on uh, um, some of the atomic physics of the time. There's a guy named Ernest Rutherford. And he, he turned to the people in his group and he said, hey, we've run out of money. It's time to start thinking. Uh, we've, in a sense, run out of money or certainly run out of uh, if not money, because we seem to be able to print and create as much you know, money as we want, we've run out of productivity. We've run out of ways to invest our time and resources that pay back uh, a commensurate amount. Um, it's time that we start thinking, and that is what I want to help you get started doing today. So let's break down our transportation system. Let's start with this, the, the kind of basic building block. This is the hierarchical road network. And if you go to any city that has a transportation plan in North America today, that transportation plan will be broken down with a hierarchical road network. The idea that uh, we would start on very local streets, maybe a dead end cul-de-sac, that local street will pour into some type of collector street. That collector street will end up in a, a arterial street arterial road that those arterials will then flow into major arterials. Um, this is all, you know, very kind of common sense in terms of how the engineering profession and how transportation professions approach uh, the construction of our and, and the planning of our systems. It very much resembles uh, kind of a river network. I'm going to use some Midwestern terms here. So, please just interpret for your own local condition. We, we would look at like a, a ditch or a, 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 you know, a, a creek that would run into a stream, maybe into a larger brook and into a, a smaller river, into a, a larger river than into a major tributary. We understand how these systems work just intuitively. And we also grasp, and, and even engineers grasp this, that 
if you get uh, rain out on the uh, far edges of this system, if that rain is persistent enough or intense enough, uh, you will get in the tributary flooding. Um, you will get massive, massive flooding. And so what kind of things do we do? We go out to the edge and we say, you know what? Um, you can't run your water into the, straight into the ditch. You've got to retain some of that on site. You've got to allow it to percolate in. Um, we recognize that kind of the death by a thousand cuts, all these small little uh, additions to the system, even though each one independently is not that great. The cumulative effect with this type of funnel-based system is overwhelming when we get to uh, those flood points. Now, look at a river system of a different type. Instead of one of water, look at one made of asphalt and concrete. Why are we shocked when we get a little bit of rain out on the edge that it ends up as a flood? Why does this surprise us? Why, why, why does this somehow baffle us uh, to a degree that the river network doesn't? I mean, we are literally creating the flood. If we wanted to create a transportation system that generated the maximum amount of congestion possible, this is what it would look like. This is exactly what it would be. You would take every single car that was possibly available and you would channel them all to the same exact place at the same exact time every single day. This is why uh, every city in North America has a rush hour. It's a shared common experience that we all have. Um, my little town of 14,000 people has a rush hour every day. And if you were to go out during rush hour and talk to the people who are sitting there stuck in congestion, uh, they would tell you that the level of congestion here is overbearing. It's overwhelming. We need to do something to take care of it. By the way, our rush hour lasts like 10 minutes. Um, so, you know, for 10 minutes a day, we take every car that's possible and we put them in the same exact place. And then they scream that we have uh, not enough capacity. This is a flood that we create by the very design and nature of our systems. Now, we react to this flood in very kind of rote ways, right? Uh, while we make a little bit of money from this development out on the edge, the cost of this in terms of uh, the downside of this flood is tremendous. Um, instead of going out and saying, like we do with the river network, how do we retain some of this locally? How do we create uh, alternatives to getting in your car and driving to the same place at the same time? Um, what we do is we just, in a very rote way, respond to this by adding more capacity. Um, in the engineering profession, in the traffic profession, we are conditioned to always project increasing amounts of traffic. Um, these are subsequent traffic projections uh, for a highway in Washington state. And uh, you can see the, the colored lines there, the, two, uh, the yellow, the green, the orange, those are all forecasts by the DOT of what traffic would do. The black line is actually what traffic has done. So we are conditioned as engineers to always project increasing amounts of traffic, even in places where traffic is going the other direction. Here's what this looks like on a national scale. Um, when you aggregate all the uh, traffic projections of all the engineers year after year after year, huge, huge increases projected. Um, the reality is just not keeping up with that trend. And so what you get is a situation where we, we congenitally, we, 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 we systematically over-design and overbuild everything. Now, pause for a sec, because your own experience might say, well, Chuck, we haven't overbuilt. We have less capacity here. We have congestion problems. We, we need more capacity. Understand how you experience this as the user. If we over-design something, let's say we over-design it by 10%, 20%, 50%, 100%. What you experience as the user is free flow condition. You experience in the user as, a, as having no impediments. And so in a sense, you are unaware in day-to-day -day experience of over-design. Over-design has no real drawback to you. The only downside to you is that the system is going broke. You don't have the money to maintain it. And you're not exactly sure why. Boy, it should, would be nice if they raised taxes or someone else paid for this or whatever. But the idea that we would all be experiencing 
uh, the kind of pain of having to pay for things as we go and thus, you know, not tolerate over design is just not there. That feedback loop is gone. And so for over design, what we experience is just great operating conditions. On the other hand, what do we, the users, experience as under design? Well, if you under design a, a roadway by 1%, 2%, 5%, 10%, you, you experience abject congestion, just gridlock, things not working. And so in terms of the user experience, or let's flip that around, the feedback that the engineer, the designer, the, the politician, the people paying for the project experience, is that there is tremendous negative feedback for slightly under design, but there's no real social negative feedback for massively over designing. And so we systematically over design again and again and again. When we look at uh, the way we build our cities, if we were to kind of float up at rush hour and look down, what we would see is that parts of our system are absolutely flooded. They're, 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 they're the place where we funneled everything to and they're uh, under capacity. But the vast majority of our system, uh, the overwhelming amount of pavement that we have put in place is not being utilized at all. It, it, it is completely unutilized at the most busiest point of our days. This would be akin to the airlines uh, sizing their fleets for the demand they expect right before Thanksgiving and Christmas and then running empty flights for the rest of the year. We, we know this is absurd. They would never do this, yet this is how we design our auto-based transportation systems uh, everywhere across North America. Now, let me just pause here and note, how do airlines deal with this problem? We all understand, they charge more to fly at Thanksgiving and Christmas. Um, if you're willing to fly at odd hours, if you're willing to fly uh, at, at different times, um, you will pay less. If you want to fly at premium times, uh, you will pay more. Um, this is how uh, the, you know, transit systems uh, in the Northeast, uh, in, the, uh, in the West operate. Uh, they will have, you know, peak pricing at peak times. Um, only in our auto-based systems do we insist that, uh, you know, at Thanksgiving and at Christmas, when everybody wants to be there, there is enough capacity for everyone to flow at, uh, at peak speeds. This idea of the flood and creating the flood has also aligned with another idea from the engineering profession in ways that are pernicious. This, this idea is called forgiving design. Um, I'm not gonna go through the whole history of highway design, except just to say that it has been, uh, especially in the early days, kind of a uh, hack of a process. Um, we look today at all of these very thick manuals we have that describe exactly how things are supposed to be done, um, exactly how we go about building this curve or, or that type of interchange, where we put signs, where we put uh, pavement markings. And it all looks very like thought out and official, but the, the reality is, um, is that it was a system that evolved over time. It was one that was created uh, in response to what was very chaotic conditions. When we first started building highways, what did we do? We went out and we took the old uh, cart paths that people used to drive down in literally stagecoaches, buggies, and we put high performance surfaces on those. Um, we would take uh, you know, a rutted out wheel path and we would uh, fix up that road a little bit. Maybe we wouldn't put asphalt or concrete, um, but we would put some aggregate and we'd make it a little bit smoother and we make it so an automobile could drive over it. What would you do if you were driving a buggy or you were building a, a pathway for a stagecoach and you came to a massive rock or a, a big tree uh, or a, 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 a gully? Well, you would just go around it. You would just build your path to go around it. Why would you bother taking those things out? Um, you were going so slow, you might as well just, you know, go around that big tree. Not, you're not going to take it down. The problem is when you then put a high performance vehicle on that, those corners, those turns become just deadly. And people were going off the road. They were hitting trees. They were hitting rocks. They were going in gullies. And the rate of fatality in the early highway days was phenomenal. It, it, was, it was grotesque. It was... Uh, an abomination. Engineers, 
because they're very smart people, um, looked at this problem and said, you know what? I think we can do something about this. Um, we can actually uh, intuit the way people will respond to our designs and we can design roadways that will forgive the common mistakes that drivers make. Th th this is a genius uh, insight. And it's an insight that has literally saved untold, I, I would ask millions and millions of lives. Um, let me walk you through how this would be applied. So here, here's a road through the countryside. You've got a two lane road, traffic going in each direction. We understand that with oncoming vehicles, if, if you were to float a little bit, if you were to, you know, look, look, you know, at your radio or glance at the kid in the back seat and, and you accidentally floated a little bit in the other lane, you might get in a head on uh, collision. And so what engineers said is, you know what, we need to forgive that float. We need to allow people a, a little bit of extra room. And so what they did is they widened out the lanes. Let's make the lanes a little bit wider, give people a little bit of buffer room on each side. Then we understood that, you know what, sometimes people are going along and despite their best intentions, despite their, you know, earnestness in driving, uh, there will be something that will happen. Maybe uh, something runs out on the roadway. Maybe something is dropped on the roadway. Um, maybe they just have a moment of inattention and they go off the edge. What we want to do is we want to forgive that mistake as well. We want to have room for recovery. And so let's widen out that that recovery zone area on the edge and, and give them a little bit of space where if they go off, they're not going to, uh, you know, hit that lip and get drawn off and, 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 and get into a crash. Um, now we understand that, you know, even with this design here, um, vehicles traveling along will sometimes exit the roadway completely. There'll be some reason why uh, they will exit the roadway. And what we don't want is we don't want them to crash into something that is inanimate, something that will not move and will not yield. Um, there's, a, there's a saying, kind of a joke in the engineering profession that, you know, it, it's not speed that kills, it's difference in speed. Um, if you're going 60 miles an hour and the tree is going 60 miles an hour, not a big deal. Um, the fact that the tree is going zero is the problem. And so the idea here is, we want to get rid of those inanimate objects that will cause that kinetic energy that we have um, to not to be dissipated too quickly. We want to be able to dissipate that before you run into something. And so bye bye trees, we get rid of them. And now we have forgiving design. Now we have a, a roadway designed to forgive the mistakes, uh, the innocent mistakes that drivers often make. Again, I'm going to reiterate, this has saved untold millions of lives. I mean, th this has been, this is a genius innovation to recognize that humans have innate fallibility. Um, we are not perfect. Even the most attentive driver is going to make a mistake from, you know, now and then. And what we want to do is make sure that our designs uh, forgive those mistakes and reduce uh, the impact of them. What is the problem with forgiving design? When we're talking about the open roadways, this approach has been copied around the world. It's genius. It's brilliant. The problem with forgiving design is when we bring it into our cities, when we bring it into our urban areas, when we take these design principles and we say these also apply here. Because when you widen out lanes, when you put in recovery areas, when you remove obstacles, what you do is you induce people to drive faster than they otherwise would you create a false sense of safety. In a place where you have an incredible amount of complexity, you have simplified down the driving experience and it created for the driver a false sense of simplicity. Forgiving design has no place in our cities, yet all of our design manuals for how we build are based on the insights of forgiving design, are based on the insights uh, gained in this early highway building era. Uh, we have a saying at Strong Towns, uh, if you need a sign to tell people to slow down, you designed your street wrong. Uh, there is a, a way of building streets um, that is not uh, a standard practice in North America, uh, but is standard practice in other parts of the world. Um, you could think of it as a self-describing uh, street, uh, a, a street that um, actually conveys to the driver as they're driving 
the proper speed that they should be driving and not doing that through signs and regulations, which are, you know, most often ignored, but actually through the design of a street. If we think about wanting people to drive more slowly through a neighborhood, you would actually do the opposite of forgiving design. You would actually uh, bring the street trees back in. You would actually reduce the recovery area. You would actually narrow up the lanes. What you would do is you would transfer the feeling of insecurity uh, back to the driver so that the driver has the same level of attentiveness that should go along with the environment that they're operating in. When we look at engineering manuals, what we often see is something like this. Um, this is a, a standard diagram that shows the relationship between uh, arterial streets, collector streets, and local streets. And just to kind of go back to the very beginning where we showed the hierarchical road network, when we're talking arterial, we're talking about uh, ways to get to a place. We're talking about, you know, highways and major roadways. We're talking about locals. We're talking about the street in front of your place, the street in front of your business, um, you know, the, the, the local cul-de-sac, that kind of thing. And what this chart shows is that there is a trade-off between mobility and access. There's a trade-off between how quickly we can get through a place and how much of a place we actually have. Um, and the idea here is that, you know, you can have an arterial where you have high mobility, but you're not going to have much stuff there. Or you can have a local street where mobility is really low, but you're going to have a lot of, of things, a lot of access. That's where you're going to have your houses and your businesses. There's this fascinating area, however, in the middle. And that's why this, this kind of curvy slope is really, really interesting. Um, this is kind of the have your cake and eat it too, where you can have your access, you can have your mobility when you're in a collector. Now, we know and understand here at Strong Towns that we can build arterials uh, really cost effectively. They're very expensive, yes, but they provide immense amount of value. When you can move people from one place to another, you're creating a lot of value for both of those places. And when we do this uh, very well, when we build great roads, um, we can make really strong, powerful investments. We also understand that when we focus on building a place, when we focus on building successful places, those are investments we can also make in a real cost productive way. We can invest money in the place and we can actually see a return in terms of the tax base and the revenue that's created off of that place. It's this middle area here, this have your cake and eat it too uh, area where we spend enormous amounts of money, uh, but we get back very little in terms of tax base. We spend an enormous amount on mobility. We get back very little by comparison in terms of access, in terms of a place. Incidentally, as long as we're kind of on this, um, these we can build very safe as well. Uh, we can build arterials and have lots and lots of people move far distances at speed uh, in manners that are very, very safe. Um, we can build local streets that are also very safe. And while, you know, there, there's sometimes a high propensity of collisions in these areas, they tend to be uh, very low stakes collisions, fender benders, that kind of thing. Um, it's this area in the middle, this area where we combine speed with complexity that we wind up with uh, the dangerous design, where we wind up with tragedy. Anytime you combine high speeds with complexity, with turning movements, random stops and starts, uh, merging traffic, turning traffic, all this kind of stuff, you get an environment that is incredibly, incredibly dangerous. What we have done at Strong Towns and the way that we would approach this same type of chart here is, is to take it and, and, and flip it on its side and say, okay, at what speeds are we creating the most value? So what you see here in the horizontal is the speed. You'll see at the far left, you've got 10 miles an hour. At the far right, you've got 70. At what point are we creating the most value? Value is in the uh, vertical. And what we see is that when we're traveling at very, very low speeds, when we're building a place, we create a tremendous amount of value because the place itself creates wealth. The place itself creates value. When we are traveling at very fast speeds, in other words, when we're getting from one place to another very quickly, what we're doing is we're creating an immense amount of value because of the commerce and the flow back and forth between those places. The further we get away from those extremes and the more we get into the middle, 
where we're not really creating a place, but we're investing lots of money into moving around, where we're not really creating an environment that is generating wealth for us, but we're building things that are really, really dangerous to operate in and be in, we see is those places have the least amount of value. This is the area that we call the strode. Um, a street uh, is a platform for building wealth in a place. A road is a high-speed connection between places. The strode is the hybrid of the two. Uh, we call this the futon of transportation. The, the, the idea you know, of a futon is you have an uncomfortable couch that makes into an uncomfortable bed. A strode tries to do two things at once and does neither of them well. It tries to be both street and road. This is the, the quintessential Strode uh, picture that we have used for years. Um, when you look at this photo, you see that they have created elements of a street here. They put in the decorative lights, they put in the wide sidewalks, um, they put in some benches and, and, and crosswalks. At times of year, they'll put out banners and other things. They've tried to make this as walkable as possible. They've tried to make it a walkable street. The problem is, uh, this doesn't function at all like a street. Um, nobody going to one of those buildings on the left is going to walk across and, and go to the right, right? They're not gonna walk across seven lanes. Um, the traffic will be moving too quickly. It, it's not safe, it doesn't feel safe. They're probably not gonna walk down to the light even and hit that and wait. What they're gonna do is they're gonna get in their car and they're gonna do a U-turn and go across the street. We see this in towns like this all the time. In fact, you can look and these buildings have not uh, aligned themselves in a high productivity street type of format. They've all built parking lots and drive-throughs and what have you because they're responding to the way people utilize this environment. Even though there's been tons of investment made to increase the returns and make this a productive street, the productivity of it goes way, way down. We've also not built a good road here. Um, a road is a, pl uh, is, is a high-speed connection between places. You can think of a road as like a replacement of a railroad. A railroad, you get on in one spot, you get off in another. There's a high-speed connection between the two. When we look at this, this is not a high-speed connection. Even though we have four highway-scaled lanes, very, very wide, forgiving design type of lanes, even though we put a center turn lane to get that turning traffic out of the way so the through traffic can speed right through unhindered, nobody gets to drive quickly through here. The speed limits are set low, 30 miles an hour at the most. And so what happens is despite all the extra money spent building a roadway, building all this capacity, people are forced to drive very, very slow. You lose the value of the road. This is the most expensive. Uh, lowest financially returning type of transportation investment we can make. It is also the most dangerous type of transportation investment we can make. If you are traveling more than 20 miles an hour or less than 50 miles an hour, you are on a strode. And strodes are the default way that we built our environments today. It is the default type of transportation investment that we make. When we think about transportation, and this idea that we need more money. What we really need is to make better use of the investments we've already created. And for the most part, that is going to mean fixing our strodes, turning our strodes either into wealth creating streets or into high performance roadways, one or the other. Um, if we can spend our time and our energy putting the, the 50%, 60%, 80% of our road, roadway miles that are strodes into something that is going to be productive and returning for us. Um, we can take the existing investments that we've made and make them really pay off. What I'm going to show you right now are the simple ways to do this. And I'm going to say simple. From an engineering standpoint, turning a strode into a street is ridiculously easy. From an engineering standpoint, turning a strode into a road is also ridiculously easy. Where it's not easy is when we get outside of the realm of engineering, when we get into economics and culture and societal expectations. Um, these things become very problematic when they're turned into social, cultural, political, economic conversations, as opposed to just pure engineering analysis. If we want to take a strode and make it into a street, here's what we do. We slow traffic. 
Like that's the first thing we do is we dramatically slow traffic. We do the opposite of forgiving design. We create constraints on the traffic flow. We actually want to slow down cars moving through these areas. We want to prioritize people. So we want to prioritize the people who are in that habitat, in that space. So prioritize pedestrians, bikers. Uh, we want transit to have priority. All of this is, is getting a greater priority over automobiles in this space. We need to intensify adjacent land use. This is a very complicated way of saying we just build stuff. Um, the way you build wealth in a place is to actually build wealth in the place, go out and build stuff. And so we need these neighborhoods to thicken up, to grow. That's gonna require changes in our zoning codes, in our building approach. We need these places to incrementally continue to expand. And we need to ultimately embrace the complexity that these places provide, the feedback, uh, both the painful and the delightful feedback that we get in these places, we need to recognize that streets are adaptive, changing human ecosystems, and we need to lean into that. This is the exact opposite of what we do if we want to make our strodes into roads. Again, very easy. First of all, we need to limit access. Um, we want travel to be very quick and very safe. And the way you make travel safe and quick in a road environment is you eliminate complexity. You get rid of those turning vehicles. You get rid of all those accesses. You make it a very uh, kind of, you know, a, a very simplified type of design. You uh, separate and segregate automobiles from other modes of travel. Um, you put your, uh, you would not put people walking and biking anywhere near you wanted to have a roadway. And sometimes that makes uh, the bike advocates angry with me. They're like, well, I should be able to bike here too. Okay, but there is no way, there is no engineering way to make it safe for someone to bike on the shoulder of a road when vehicles are going over 30 miles, you know, over 20 miles an hour. It just is not, it is not. Um, and particularly when you have vehicles going 40, 50, 60 miles an hour, there's no way to make this safe. I'm a huge bike advocate. I think we need more biking. When we're talking about roadway environments, those uh, facilities need to be provided separate and, and, and delineated differently. So there's physical separation between the high speed of the vehicles and the safety of those uh, different ways of operating. Um, we need to not allow the adjacent land use to degrade our capacity. The idea that we would collectively, all of us, put lots of money into building a high-speed roadway, and then we would allow the local community uh, to, you know, bring in the Walmart, bring in the Quickie Mart, bring in the McDonald's, bring in the, the gas station, and essentially siphon off or mine the wealth of that investment for short-term local economic gain is, is a losing strategy. We need to keep these places as high performance roadways, not as uh, essentially collective investments for really low returning short term strode types of gains. And then finally, we just need to lean into the notion that this is a simplified environment. We, th these are not places where we're going to have complex feedback loops. These are places where we're going to simplify down to the base element and just make it a great roadway. Roads are really simple. In fact, roads are really simple. They almost defy uh, explanation. They're so basic. Um, we have two places people want to be, place one and place two, and we create a roadway between them. That's it. That's what a roadway is. It's a connection between two places. And we see vehicles going back and forth on this. Um, there are all kinds of ways to respond to roadways as these places become more successful, as that connection between them allows uh, goods and commerce and people to flow back and forth. Um, those places will become wealthier, they'll become more prosperous, they will grow, traffic will grow, uh, the amount of use on this will grow. We've got lots of ways to respond to this. We can respond to it by adding more capacity because you can add more capacity to a roadway. That's a very logical thing to do. Um, when you're, you know, not uh, dumbing it down, when you're not denuding it, when you're not flooding it, when you've actually got places you're connecting. Um, we can also uh, increase the capacity of the existing roads to handle more people traveling back and forth from one place to another. I always tell transit advocates, if you are a fan of transit, if you want transit to work, build great places that people want to be. Transit is a really ridiculously cost-effective 
uh, type of thing when you have people in one place who want to be in another place. When you have dispersed people over a broad area, transit becomes really difficult to do at scale, at budget, in a competitive way, both from a travel time and a cost standpoint. But if you're going to have people in one place and they want to be in another place and you can create nodes back and forth, you can build a world-class transit system on a shoestring budget. Of course, when our transit gets more and more demand, we can improve our capacity. There's all kinds of things we can do with well-placed, well-designed roadways to handle growth and increasing demand. This is almost too simple to describe. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's hard for us to grasp this, that we actually could do a lot less in terms of our roadways and get a lot more if we just simplified down the charge that we were putting uh, on them, on what our expectations were for what they would do. Streets are a completely different story. And if you walk away from this presentation with one thing, I want it to be this. Financially productive places, great streets are more of an art than a science. It's more of an art form than a science. It is going to be something that is going to require more artistry, more uh, iterative work, more uh, kind of complex feedback than opening up a design manual and saying, here's ABC, how we build a great street. In the presentation I gave two weeks ago, I went through the economics of this little picture. This is my hometown back in 1870. Um, what I want you to look at this time is not the buildings like I showed you last time. I want you to look at the street. Um, look at the iteration of the street as we go through time. Th this is, you know, a nothing street, right? Like this was, um, they might have removed a few stumps here or what have you, but th this represents, you know, a very low, low value, low intensity street. But it corresponds to the low value, low intensity of what is adjacent to it, right? There's a, there's a correlation there between what we have built and the infrastructure we've built in the street. You see the same thing in the next photo. The, the buildings, the land use becomes more intense. So does the street. You've got wooden sidewalks now. You've got a more graded, more finished uh, type of surface. By the time we get to the next iteration of the same street, you can see right there in the middle, uh, the stormwater drain. We've got uh, you know, concrete sidewalks and curbs. We've got drainage. Um, we've done a, a, you know, a paved surface here. We've got a far more advanced street. The idea that there is one street design, the idea that we would go in and say, well, this is a, you know, X kind of street. And so we're going to go build it regardless of what is adjacent to it, regardless of what is there, regardless of the related land use um, is, is trying to, in a sense, simplify an art form down to a science, down to a formula, down to a cookbook. Great places, places that people want to be, do not come from a cookbook. I, I'm going to go through these real quickly. Uh, I showed these in the last presentation. I'm not going to belabor it, but there's a point I want to make about financial productivity here. Uh, again, two example blocks, the one on the left, old and right, of the, the one on the right, shiny and new. Here's what they look like. Uh, we're looking at, you know, that traditional pattern of development on the left, the, uh, the modern style of development on the right. Uh, the huge difference in financial productivity. If you weren't with us two weeks ago, uh, go to the Strong Town site and just type in Taco John's or the cost of auto orientation. You're going to get this whole case study. Um, the other one out here on the edge of town, uh, the big, big box store, uh, the 20 acres, um, compared to the 20 acres in the core downtown that's been denuded and neglected, and we still see this same type of, of productivity. When we're looking at building successful places, when we're looking at the financial productivity of a place, um, what we're trying to get in a street, in a great street network, is places that build wealth. And that is the thing on the right. That is the, uh, the block on the left. If we want to build wealth, um, what we are doing is we are building places. Uh, these are the Joe Minicozzi maps, um, the same ones I showed a couple of weeks ago of financial productivity. Uh, when we look at those walkable neighborhoods, when we look at those core incremental places, what we see is they are generating tremendous amounts of wealth, tremendous amounts of financial productivity. This is our street network, not our road network. When we focus on building great places, that's where we create the value of a street. Here's the thing. When we go to all those financially productive places, when we go to um, all those places where we see the high returns, 
when we go to the ones where when we model city after city after city, we see the highest amount of financial productivity, the highest amount of profit in our municipal corporation, this collection of us that we run. There is one thing that we see again and again and again show up in these places, and that is human beings. Humans are the indicator species of success. When you are out trying to do this art form of building a great street, when you are out iterating, trying to do the next step of, of, of what you can do to make it better, you will know you are succeeding when you start to see humans show up. When you start to see people come out and exist in the habitat, uh, you know that you are succeeding. Humans are the indicator species of success. When we're building streets that are financially productive and successful, we will see humans there. I've got two last points I want to share with you. Um, and these get to our values and how we value uh, our systems and, and the, the, design, the design decisions we're making. When engineers go out and build a street, um, they like to think of it as a, a valueless approach, an approach where they are not, in a sense, imposing their values on society, but they're merely reflecting a rational design approach. Um, this is, of course, absurd. The engineering profession is full of values. Um, the values are just so deeply embedded, in, in a sense, in an ideology that they're not even identified uh, as values. When engineers go out and design a street, um, they have a, a very set hierarchy of things they value. The first thing they will say is, what is the design speed for this street that we're going to build? Then they will say, what is the volume of traffic that we're expected to handle? Then, given the speed and given the volume, what does the design book say uh, we should do in order to have it be safe? And then how much will that cost? These are the values of the engineering profession in order as they are, as they are applied during a design process. I have gone out and given this talk to thousands and thousands of people across North America. And I, I do this thing where I ask people, to identify their values. And we go through this exercise and I'll say, what's the most, you know, of these four, if you are looking at your place, if you're looking at the streets in your neighborhood, where you shop, where you go out to eat, if you're looking at the streets in your place that you're expecting to build wealth, what would be the values that you would apply? What are the order that you would put these? And everyone always says, number one, safety. That's the thing they would put first. And then when we ask again, they'll say the number two is cost. We want things to be cost effective. And the third thing they always say, and this is universal, I, the crowds just shout this out. I say, what do you think? Uh, they will say, we want to move volume of cars is more important than the speed. And when we look at these values, what we see time and time again is that the human values are actually the values that are the consensus values. When we're building successful streets, when we're building great places people want to be, they're willing to sacrifice speed. They're willing to sacrifice volume in order to achieve cost effectiveness and safety. That is uh, the application of our cultural values to a place. What I want everyone listening here today to understand is that your values are not wrong. They're just not embodied in the design process. And you need to be willing to go out and assert them. As a last concept, I want to touch on complete streets. Um, complete streets, many of us have experienced the idea of complete streets. It's a very kind of catchy concept. I remember back in the, uh, in the early and mid 90s, um, when I first started to hear about complete streets, uh, we all in the engineering profession kind of laughed at this. It was, uh, you know, touchy feely and silly. And what are we doing here? Um, we eventually grew to really like it. And I think you see engineers embracing it uh, kind of universally now today. And the reason they embrace it is twofold. One, they get paid more money for doing it. There's actually more uh, budget that comes with building something like this. And you can justify larger budgets, larger what have you for doing it. So, so that doesn't force them to rethink or compromise anything. Um, but the second thing is uh, a complete street doesn't, uh, compromise or doesn't um, undermine uh, the values of the engineering approach. It allows us to keep those speed, volume, safety, cost hierarchy in place as we apply it to a street. You know, the whole fundamental idea of a complete street is that everything gets its own place. 
it's a little bit like, you know, if Oprah were designed streets, like, you know, you get a lane, you get a lane, you get a lane, everybody gets a lane. There's no uh, idea here of, of anything, you know, of the, in a sense, auto-oriented design uh, focus having to compromise at all. Um, here's how I would describe this. Complete streets accommodate pedestrians within an auto-dominated environment. This is a huge improvement over the despotic way we've been building places for decades and decades and decades. And so I applaud Complete Streets for doing that and making that approach, but understand this is accommodating pedestrians in an auto-dominant environment. If we wanna produce a truly productive place, if we wanna build great streets, if we wanna build strong towns, those are places that accommodate automobiles with an environment dominated by people. It's people that create value. It's people that are the indicator species of success. If you want to build wealthy, wealth producing, highly productive places, you have to build them for people. And when people show up, you know you're doing it right. E.F. Schumacher said, any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. We have run out our capacity uh, to build things bigger, more complex, and more violent. We, we, have, we are literally out of money. We need to start thinking, right? Um, it is going to take that touch of genius, uh, a little bit of courage to assert a different set of values and a different understanding. Um, but if we can do those things, not only can we move in an opposite direction, uh, but we can move in a direction of prosperity, of increased safety, uh, of building better places, places that we love to be in and enjoy, places uh, that are connected by great road networks that are free of congestion or reduce congestion that allow us to have those economic gains that transportation should provide without the kind of constant downward cycle of build it, congestion, build it, congestion. We can build fantastic transportation networks if we just focus our approach on building great roads and great streets, uh, eliminating our strodes and focusing on the productivity of our places. That is in essence, the strong towns approach. Um, I want to, and I realize that I don't think that that URL works. I didn't take that out. Um, go to strongtowns.org. Don't go to dash chat. Um, if you do whatever you sign up for, you're probably not going to get uh, back what you're looking for. Um, I do want to make one last announcement. We still have 400 and some people on in, uh, we're a tiny bit over time. Um, we, we call this presentation Confessions of a Traffic Engineer. A lot of you have um, gotten a copy of my book last year. In fact, I'm gonna exit out of this so I can talk to you without this tiny little window. Um, a number of you got a copy of my book, Strong Towns. Um, and one of the feedback that I got is, Chuck, uh, you, you came up with this, uh, this idea of a strode. You invented this word. Um, why did you talk about strodes at all in this book? Why didn't you talk at all about transportation or all the things that you've done over the years uh, about transportation systems? I'm going to tell you right now, friends, here's why. Um, second book is in process right now. Uh, I'm under contract to uh, write a second book. Um, Confessions of a Traffic Engineer is the working title right now. Um, that book should, it, it's due this fall and it should be coming out early next year. So we're going to be taking this uh, transportation conversation uh, back out on the road whenever we get uh, the ability to do that again. And uh, just like we did with the last book, go out and share this in as many places as we can. Transportation is like the way we have tried to, from a top down, create prosperity in this country. From the interstates to every, every kind of top-down highway initiative that's come out of that, where now you know, we've got the federal government funding the sidewalk out in front of your house. Very much like we talked about in our book, A Bottom-Up Revolution to Rebuild American Prosperity. Um, we have to refocus our transportation initiatives uh, around the needs of people, around the needs of, of humans in our human habitat. And so regardless of how we're gonna fund it, regardless of how we're gonna come together and do this, um, we need you, we need people to actually assert their own values in their place because that's how our cities are going to be successful. Um, so look for that, look for more on that in the near future. Um, you all get the, uh, 
the advanced preview because we've not announced this anywhere else or told anyone. I'm, we're working on covers right now, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to share that pretty soon. Um, thanks, everybody. Look for the follow-up email that gets you connected to the community site so you can ask some questions. I will be here on Thursday to try to answer as many of those as I can. Um, I'm getting all the chat things pop up right now, and uh, I love you guys. Thanks so much for uh, the kind words and the, uh, the constant encouragement. Let's all go out and do what we can to build strong towns. Peace, everybody. Take care.